I'm Bob Darrow. I'm an alcoholic. And I've been sober since October 31st, 1978. That's over over 44 years of being wrong. Uh, Because we grow by our willingness to be wrong. We don't grow from being right. Or else it would say somewhere in our literature, and when we were right, we promptly admitted it. Uh, Randy, Randy picked me up at the... At the airport, my wife and I, Marty, my wife's here with me. She travels with me. And she's, yeah, she's, I get this fear that one day she's going to come to her senses <laughs> and realize she's made a big mistake. <laughs> but I'll, I like being with her in the meantime. Uh, <laughs> she's perfect for me. Um, and I, I want to thank, uh, that was the best introduction I've had. I told, I told you before, I said, you can say that. Tell him, I'm, tell him you don't think I've been drinking today. But, but don't, I don't like to be grandized because we're here not, for, not to enhance our personalities. We're here to promote our principles and, to, and the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what, that's what this is really about. This has been a great uh, weekend, every speaker so far, it's been AA. And I, not everything you'll hear in Alcoholics Anonymous is, feels like AA. This has been AA. And I didn't hear the one speaker last night, but everybody else I've heard has been AA. And I, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, but I didn't for a while. I came here uh, before I was old enough to take a legal drink. I was I, I was not an alcoholic. I could have admitted to being a, a drug addict because that was kind of sexy, you know, and cool. Uh, or I could have, I'll even be willing to be a mental health case because they give you pills and sympathy for that. And I like both of those. I'm good with that. But I don't want to be an alcoholic. And I was an alcoholic. And I was dying from, from a disease I didn't want to have. And uh, until I... 1978, I was in jail, facing two years in a state penitentiary. I went to an AA meeting because I knew I could bum cigarettes there in the jail. And a guy nailed me. And he said something that really upset me. I, he, I tried to, he had a lot of money, and I tried to get him to put his house up so I could get out on bail. <laughs> People in AA, they want to help you until you explain it to them. And he, he doesn't. He wants to get me a book and help me with stairs of some sort. I don't know what he. I don't. But I don't. I don't want a book. I need out of here. And so I, I, I rallied. You know that egocentric rally that we do. That adamacy. You know that self righteous stuff. My, I love self righteous. The problem with self righteous is self, basically. And um, but I got real self righteous with him. And I, you know, how dare you? S- he, I, I told him I was my plans, and he said, you're not going to do any of that, kid. You're going to be dead before the year's out, which came this close to being true. And I, uh, he, said, he said to me, he said, you're not going to do any of that, kid, because you haven't surrendered. And I didn't know what he meant. I remember sitting in the meeting. Did you ever sit in the meeting with a resentment? You don't say anything. Did you ever sit there and just think at someone? I'm just thinking, I'm thinking, how dare you say that to me, you know? I didn't know what, I remember thinking, surrender? Surrender what? There's nothing left of me. When they gave me the phone call, when they arrested me, there was no one to call. No one to call. That is a horrible feeling. When you need help more, and a friend more than you ever needed help in a friend, and there's no one left, and you kind of know you did it. Didn't mean to do it, but I knew I did it. And I uh, just sat through that whole meeting and ch- chewed on that surrender, surrender what for God's sake. I didn't know what he meant. I know exactly what he meant. Because not too long after that, uh, I tried to commit suicide. And I tried to commit suicide not because of the consequences of my drinking. And let me tell you something, they were severe. 
But I tried to commit suicide because I was in a trap I couldn't spring. I was in a place that something horrible had happened, and it had happened for a couple of years. It just took me a couple of years of failure to accept it. And what that is is that somehow the bottle had turned on me, and I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why when I drink now I don't get free. And, I, and alcohol at one time freed me from the bondage of self. And it didn't do that anymore. Now when I drank, I drank in self-pity and depression. I drank with horrible, horrible feelings of loneliness. I drank all by myself. I, I drank for oblivion because there's no more party. And I tried to kill myself because I can't imagine life like... I can't imagine life with it, not the way it has become... And I can't imagine life without it because I'm just as messed up when I'm sober. I, I, not only do I have this abnormal reaction to alcohol, I know I can't just drink, but I drink. But I also have this abnormal reaction to abstinence. And it's killing me. And I don't understand it. And I don't understand that's alcoholism. And I, in, in 1978, in my last detox Something had happened to me, and I didn't understand it until I went, within the first month or so out of the detox, I went to an intergroup meeting, and the speaker was a guy they had every year, a guy named Chuck Chamberlain. And Chuck said one thing, said a lot of things, but most of it was over my head. But he said one thing that, that, that got me. He said he'd been surrendered by the bottle. And I remember thinking, maybe that's why I'm doing things today that I never was willing to do in all the years I relapsed. Maybe that's why today I'm somewhat sponsorable. Maybe that's why, even though I don't believe in God, I'm praying. Maybe that's why. And and we all know, uh, my friend Clint used to say this a lot. It was such a beautiful analogy. He said, we all know what surrender is. We all know what it looks like. You see it in war movies all the time. When people are faced with annihilation, and what do they do when they surrender? Well, the first thing they do is they lay down every single means to defend themselves. And then they sit there and they wait for somebody to tell them what to do. And I guess that's kind of what happened to me. I didn't know that right away. But, I, but something dramatically had changed within me. And, and I was the guy, I used to read a lot. I was the guy who was, I, I was a, a counselor. I, I, I studied with Ellis and just and, and gestalt therapy. I, I was in so much therapy that you would have thought I'd have been fixed. But I got worse. I kept getting worse. And I, I stu- and I tried to learn everything I could about the inner workings, you know, of me, because I suffer from an ego disorder, and that ego disorder presents itself at times to me as if I'm going to find power and knowledge, and I never truly, I never found power and knowledge. What I would find is fodder that fed my ego. You know, when you when you're the guy who knows everything, you know that guy. Some of us have been that person. I've been that. I was that person. I was the guy that knew everything. You, I fit the old adage. You can always tell an alcoholic you can't tell him much, because I'm too full of me, and I didn't know it. Uh, a couple people had commented on the on that part of step three. Uh, Larry, uh, Charlie's talk last night was phenomenal. So was Kent. So was Rouse. I just I feel very inadequate coming into this after all those talks, but. It was referenced that that line in the book, which I don't know if Wilson was trying to be funny when he said it, when he wrote it, but it's so true for me. He says that we are extreme examples of self-will run riot, though we usually don't think so. (laughs) I have never been in the middle of a self-will run riot binge and stopped in the middle of it and said, oh, I'm in the middle of a self-will run riot binge. (laughs) I've never said that. It's never occurred to me. Because the ego defends the ego, right? And, and, and so I don't get it. And, and I, uh, so I get sober in 1978. My sponsor got me taking actions I didn't believe in because that's what surrendered people do. You know, you, you suspend your opinion. 
you suspend being in charge. Or as it says in the book, we lay aside our prejudices, which is everything I think I know. And I started taking these actions. And, I, you know, you get up. What happens? The problem, I had this surrender experience in the early sobriety, surrendered by the bottle. But surrender, even though it may very well be the solution to alcoholism, like every solution in this universe, it has a tendency to evaporate. And the ego comes back. I, I love the, the, some of the writings of Harry Tebow, uh, who worked with Bill Wilson and Marty Mann, and was uh, on our board and spoke at one of our internationals. And, and he talks about the, we must have ego reduction at depth, which I think that suicide attempt did that for me. It, there's a line in the book that talks about being crushed. And I was crushed. I just didn't know it. It just felt bad to me. If she would have said to me, you feel really bad, don't you? Yeah. Oh, this is so good. I mean, you know, I wouldn't, I don't feel, it was horrible. But crushed. And I, uh, he also, Harry Tebow also talked about no matter how surrendered you are, there's, the ego has re- amazing recuperative powers. It grows back like a bad, like a bad tumor. The problem is you don't know it. You don't know it. Because it it even uses my own recovery to prop it up. You know, I I went through a phase. I I loved Ralph's talk. Because I'm that guy. I'm the guy who goes after when my ego comes back. Here's what it looks like experientially. Now, I don't know what's going on. But it comes back and it's like, it's not ego. I'm, not, I'm fine here. But I start noticing what's wrong with people so clearly. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just, you know, you just sit in a meeting and it's just, you, you walked in, you, you, you're under the illusion you're surrendered. You walk in and four cups of coffee and no money in the basket, huh? <laughs> I'm not going to say anything because humble people don't say anything. <laughs> I'll just know smugly what's wrong with him. And then, oh, then, you know, someone else is, gets up and keeps walking around. And there's some girl walking around in the meeting. And I thought, oh, my God, why does she keep wanting to show off her new plastic surgery? Stop it. <laughs> you know? Oh, just, and I start noticing. Well, you know what happens. I eventually, I did a fourth step. I did two fourth steps, not out of the big book. I did one life story. Very honest, very honest. Didn't change that much. Did one out of the 12 by 12, the 30-some questions, and write about the seven deadly sins. Interesting. Didn't change that much. And then I came to the book. And it's, it's designed to dismantle the thing the ego does the most. It creates opinions and judgments. And my whole resentment list, you could say it was all my judgments. It was all my opinions. And I got some uh, ego reduction from that. And you know how you can know when you got that? You know what it looks, feels like, and see, think? It, it's, it's like you're back to the place where you don't know anything anymore. You know? Or you just, I don't know. There's no atomacy in me anymore. There's no edge. You know that edge that, that's, that's needed when you notice what's wrong with people, right? You need that edge because it, it drives you. And, but it was gone for a while. And then it comes back, you know, and I don't know it. And, and it keeps coming back. And I was thinking when Ralph was talking about, okay, I, I saw so so clearly how pathetically childish and judgmental I was. Because by by the time you're several years sober and you do an inventory, it's mostly people in AA. You know what I mean? Because, you know, you notice the things about them, for God's sakes. So I'm not going to be that way anymore. I'm not going to be that way anymore. And almost immediately, I started noticing the noticers. Feeling a bit 
smug that I'd outgrown that. <laughs> oh, now I've now I've graduated to noticing the noticers of the noticers. Uh, it's, never, it's like that. It's like that arcade game that the kids play called Whack a Mole. You hit you hit a defect down, it pops up somewhere else. You know. Because the ego is so, my, my ego, I'm only going to speak for me, is so resilient. And it's clever. I, I remember to kind of, I started doing stuff out of the big book in the early 80s. After I heard my first Joe and Charlie set of talks from the International. So it was late 81, I guess. Or not late 80, probably maybe early 81, I guess. And started taking people through the book and doing some uh, some big book stuff, you know, like... Uh, experiential workshop. Well, they, in the beginning they were factual, academic workshops. Uh, have one at my house. It's been going on for over 35 years. Um, and I remember, here's what my ego did. And if you relate to this, God help you. <laughs> I go to a meeting one day. Now, I'm this big book guru. And I go to a meeting, and it's a discussion meeting, but the subject step four. Okay? So I'm sitting in the audience and people are sharing and it's like, (laughs) (laughs) what are they talking? They don't, evidently, I could see it clearly, nobody here has really done the fourth step. (laughs) Evidently. And the chairman is a guy I know, he's sober a little bit longer than I am and I I have a lot of faith that he's going to call on me last to clear this mess up for AA, (laughs) right? Because, you know, it needs to be cleared up. Nobody's talking about this was our course, and nobody's talking about the columns, and they're just, it's all BS. It's all, and I'm the only one that knows, really. <laughs> Finally, in the end of the, the meeting ends, and he didn't call on me. Now, that's the makings of a terrible meeting right there. <laughs> and I go up to him because I can't contain myself. Because when people are out of line, they need to know. And so I go up to him, and I, he, asked, he asked me, first of all, before I could say anything, he said, what do you think of the meeting? I said, it was one of the worst meetings I've ever been at. He said, it was a great meeting. Oh, you called on, every, everyone you called on doesn't even, never even work. They don't know what they're talking about. He said, I thought it was a great meeting. There was some great, honest sharing. You don't even, you've never done a fourth step, have you? And he said, I've done a fourth step. He's sober longer than I was. And what did my ego do? It took even something that's designed to reduce my ego and create unity, and it used it to create even more separation and to feed that thing in me that truly should be starved. And it's devious. Cunning, baffling, powerful, resilient. And there's... I. Wouldn't it, be a wonder, wouldn't it be amazing if you could say a certain prayer or write a certain inventory a certain way and then it would just be gone? You know what I mean? It would be so gone that people would want to touch the hem of my garment. You know what I mean? Right? See? See? Right there. Right there. That's it again. That's it. Right there again. Right? That's it. That's it. So, this is what I struggle with. I probably always will. And um, so, I uh, I finished my first really good fourth and fifth step following the book, and and the I had an experience there. I I really got to see some things I never had seen before. I got to see how wrong I'd been about my mother and father and about my exes and about the bosses. Like I was wrong everywhere. And after a little while, uh, something happened and I didn't know it. That I thought that I was, I'm good now that I know. That I know. And I knew. And I think I'm good, because I know. And uh, I'm not going not gonna to be that guy anymore. 
And I was that guy. And it's demoralizing when you... Because I, I like to fantasize that I'm something I'm not. Our book refers to... It's not denial. It's not. It was denial it would be manageable. It's self-delusion. It's psychotic, wishful thinking. I'm not really free of that stuff, but I want to be so bad that I believe I am. And I, I, it's not just that I'm, I'm selling BS, I'm buying it at the same time. And I, I never, you know, my sponsor had told me to read page 76, step 6 and 7, and I, I never saw the six-step prayer. It was there, and I think I read it. But I never said it. I never took the time and mindfully tried to do what it says there, to ask God for the willingness. I didn't do it. And I, and I suspect as, as, that even if at that time, if I would have done it, it would have been very shallow. Because later when I did come back and say the prayer, I said it as if it's a once and done thing. And... Uh, it didn't work. I remember, I remember going to a meeting during this period, and it was they were talking about defects of character, and and there was some good sharing, but everybody in the meeting shared about their defects in the past tense. You know what I mean? Like, like it was something they got over. You know, like I remember when I used to be. Selfish, or I used to be angry, or I used to be a, you know, it was all that kind of stuff. And I remember sitting there thinking, feeling decrepit, just like I'm the only one that God doesn't like enough to remove this stuff. He's evidently removed it for all them. I found out later they lied about other things too, but I didn't know that at the time, right? I just feel, I just, I'm judging your outsides against my insides, and I still got all this stuff going on. Um, and I don't know what's wrong with me. And I started wondering what's what's going. What's what's this about with me? What's wrong, Bob? Because there were certain, there were some people. You know, by this time I'm sponsoring guys, and I'll tell you, you want to get a an up close and personal view of the hand of God, sponsor people and watch God work in their lives. Matter of fact, I could see God working in their life and couldn't see him working in mine. Some of these guys I'm sponsoring are spiritually just passing me by. And I uh, I became aware of something when I'm asking God for the willing when I'm asking God in step seven to take these things away that stand in the way of my usefulness, what I'm really saying unconsciously is I want him to remove the consequences of these things. And Bill's story, he, as, he, as he's going through the steps, the old Oxford group view of the steps, the, abri- the shorter version didn't have as many steps, uh, and he gets to step six and seven, he says, he says it different. He says he asked his creator to, re- to take, to remove his sins root and branch. And I remember reading that and thinking, huh, there's two parts to a defect? There, there's root and branch. Now, I guess the branch is the consequences. It's the thing that makes me ashamed of myself. It's the thing that I'll go home and can't sleep over when I've acted out on it. Right? But what's the root? Our book says that uh, selfishness, self-centeredness that we think is the root of our trouble. Is that here too? With these defects? Is that is that, that the case here? And Wilson in, in Step 7 and 12 Steps and 12 Traditions says that self-centered, and the, word, the key word is self-centered, fear, is the chief activator of all my defects. And oh my God, I started seeing how true that was. I, I have a strong 
moral compass. I am not a sociopath. Now, I've done things that sociopaths do, but i got to be drunk to do them. You know what I mean? I, because I, I, I am haunted and plagued by my conscience. I know, I've known people in AA that are sociopaths. They can, they can rip you off. They can do all kinds of stuff. It doesn't bother them. Oh, to be like that. But I'm not like that. It haunts me. It makes me, I can't, I lose sleep. I can't, it's, it messes me up. And so, uh, I, I realize that this moral compass, compass that I have is really part of the great reality deep down within me. It's God. It's, a, it's, it's God's shining through me. And get, you know, we, and we're trying to get direction and, and care from God, and that's how, that's where He gives it to me a lot of times. And it's an intuitive thing. If I'm awake. If I'm awake, and I'm, sometimes I'm not awake, I, I just don't. Sometimes this, and its need and, and yearning for self gratification, self grandizement, security, is louder than that thing in here. It's my, and that's that's why I believe that I am bodily and mentally different from non-alcoholics. And when it says in our book about being an extreme example, my daughter has such she has a strong moral compass, and it doesn't deviate. She doesn't deviate from it. I, I mean, it's just she's right on the money all the time. It, it never occurs to her to, to lie, cheat, or, or steal. I mean, I, when we used to go to, on a date every week to the movies, and uh, I tur- I'd turn, when you turn 60, you can get those cheap tickets, movie tickets. And I'd buy one for me and one for her. I'd get her a senior ticket, and she'd, she embarrassed me one time at the movie theater. She said, Dad, this is not my, this must be your ticket. I said, no, that's your ticket. She said, it's a senior ticket. I said, well, th- I wanted to run. I said, they're, they're, both, they're both senior tickets. She says, Dad, you can't do that. That's not right. And I just, oh. I had to go and pay the money. And oh, it was, I'm, I'm compromising my spiritual condition and my example to my daughter, who I love, for like a dollar and a quarter. I mean, it's like, oh my God. Oh, but it wouldn't occur to her. But she's not as extremely self-involved as I am, or, or can be. And so, uh, if selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of this, there's a great line in the book. It says, "We we must be rid of this selfishness. We must, or it kills us." And you, I don't know if you're like me, you read that and go, oh, okay. And then it comes back and says, oh, by the way, you can't. <laughs> can't wish it away any more than alcohol. You had to have God's help. Again? Oh, you know, it's like... <laughs> and self can't move self out of, the, out, of the control pan, out of the control seat. So I have to have God's help. And the problem is I don't know how to access God's grace. And that's always been my problem at times. Uh, I know it's there. I have faith in God. I just don't, truly don't trust him. And that's what the book talks about in, in the section. If, if, if all my defects are driven by self-centered fear, then the only thing that Alcoholics Anonymous offers a guy like me to overcome fear is to trust in God. Problem is, I don't know what that is. Here's, here's, here's how sad I am. I think things like gratitude, trust, etc., I think they're feelings. They're actions. And I don't know that. And then you know what happens. It happened to me. It probably has happened to everybody in this room. If you're sober over 10 years, you get, you get in a jam, bad jam. The wheels have come off your life. You don't know what the, you, you got no, you got no game here. I don't know what to do. This is horrible. And sometimes, uh, as it says in our book, you get to the place where you have to decide is God's either everything or he's nothing. Either he is or he isn't. Bob, what's your choice going to be here? 
And sometimes with the help of a sponsor, and I've had good sponsorship that just, they, they encourage me to act like someone who trusts God when the truth is I don't. I listen to my head and am more familiar with its ramblings and its fear and its anxious creating stuff than I ever have any familiarity with God. But if we're, if you're lucky, like I've been lucky, you get to be backed into a corner and you can't do anything else. So you have to show up like somebody who trusts God, hoping, scared, scared to death, hoping, hoping that God's got me like you said he did. Hoping. Because I got nothing here. And then what happens? What happens is in over time what always happens. God takes care of you. And I think trust for, for guys like me is I get to alcoholics, it's an it's an atrophied unused muscle that has nothing. And every time I exercise the trust muscle inside of me, it gets a little stronger. And if you do it long enough, I'll tell you, I know something. I I hate to even say this because next week it could just turn on me. But so far, and especially in the last few years, uh, I I really trust God. The, the The feelings started following the actions slowly and eventually, but I, you start to know. Because you, you know you know like you know anything of any value is I got a track record now with God. He's always been he's always come through. He's always given me what I needed, not what I wanted, because that's endless. He always get, he doesn't give me my will, he gives me his will, and what his will has proven to be is better than what I wanted. But you don't know that until you until you go through that and you go through that and you go through that and um, so the real problem with my defects of character is my inability to give up these things because I'm scared. I, I had my last violent episode, and, and I, never, I never considered myself a violent guy, even though I did stab a guy one time and I pistol whipped a guy one time. But it was... There were situations that called for that behavior. I mean, no, you know what I mean? I mean, was, But in sobriety, I had two episodes. And the last one, I was eight years sober. So that's like 36 years ago, I guess. And I, a guy, I, my employees caught a guy that had been robbing me. They had him spread-eagled over the hood of his car, and the cops hadn't got there yet. And I, you know what, this is, I, this is so embarrassing. He looked up at me, and he was a guy I knew, and I liked him, and I did him a lot of favors. He looked up at me, and he said, I'm sorry, but I know you're an AA, and I thought you would understand. And I snapped. I had him by the hair and was banging his head against the hood of the car until my, one of my guys had to pull me off. And here's a guy that maybe in his own lame way is asking for help. And I've gone through this book. Nowhere in working with others does it say we bludgeoned a, a new guy. I mean, it's, it doesn't say that in there. I mean, I've looked. I've looked, you know, hoping to exonerate myself. Uh, it doesn't say that. <laughs> oh. And I remember afterwards the feeling of shame. Deep, deep shame. Embarrassment. Sometimes entirely ready can look like I can't stand me. Not always. I think I heard a guy say many years ago, we either grow for pain or from inspiration. And that was from pain. I've not had an episode like that since then. Um, And then uh, I started, you know, I've, I've always sponsored guys. But there's an awakening process in sponsoring guys that, that, is part and parcel of the reality of step six. Because how do you become entirely ready? I mean, entirely ready. Entirely like a lot. (laughs) Entirely ready. 
Well, I became entirely ready when, after the shame and embarrassment of, of, of bludgeoning that guy who asked, kind of in his own way, asked for help. And then you start sponsoring people. You know what happens. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't happen in your first five years. But you start sponsoring enough, long enough. And you start waking up to something. You may not have wanted to be in this position, but you are in the position of being their primary example of how to live your life in AA and how to be a good AA member. And I'll tell you something. You start waking up to that and you have fallen in love with the guys you sponsor, it'll drive you inside to be want to be. You may not be perfect, but you'll want to be a better member of AA. It's like that, that's, that beautiful scene towards the end of the movie, as good as it gets, where he says, where Nicholson says to Hunt, he says, you make me want to be a better guy. Alcoholics Anonymous does that. It's, it's an inspiration of sorts that you... Make me want to be a better guy. And I started, uh, you know, Wilson, Chamberlain used to talk about this being a process of uncovering, discovering, and discarding. Through the whole book, it, it refers to the thing, get it, what things we have to get rid of that are blocking us. The, the, the great reality deep down within me is obscured. So it's really a... It's a, it's a removal process. And it's, the thing I'm trying to remove is me. Someone earlier said, one of the speakers said something that has absolutely been my experience for most of my sobriety. The problem is I always have too much of me between me and you and too much of me between me and God. And it creates the separation. It's the ego. And even though I may not know it at the time, it's what is. It is. And... Uh, so, I'm starting to look for the things. Why am I holding on to this stuff? I mean, it's, it's easy to write it off and just say, well, I'm just crazy and self-centered. No, nah, there's more to it than that. If what Chamberlain said was true, that this is a process of uncovering, discovering, and discarding, that means that I have, to dis- I have to uncover and discover what's the thing there. It's got me holding on to this defense mechanism, like anger. Why did I hang on? To, I, I knew, I, I know it's not right to act out on anger. I understand that. But I wanted to keep it in reserve, just in case. <laughs> because if I really had God remove it, then who's going to stand up for me the next time somebody tries to poke me out? Who's going to protect me when, I, when somebody's trying to rip me off? Who's going to stand up for Bob? You know, the old, the, this crazy old people say in AA, oh, God will take care of you. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not so sure. You know, it's easy to say. That's great podium talk. But when you're scared and you're out in the world, man, fear is... It's, it's, it's the driver, really, truly, T- to this day, at times, to this day. And so, uh, what am I holding on to? And when I was a little kid, there was a TV show. I don't know if they had it in this part of the country. Well, I was in, grew up in Pennsylvania, and they had it on television there. It was called Rescue 8. This was back in the... Mm, late 50s, early early 60s, I think. And it was about these two paramedics that worked out of a firehouse. And they would get called out on distress calls. And this one particular episode, and why I remembered this episode, I can't tell you about one other episode, but I can remember this one. It's almost like God has got his fingers in my memory, and he cooks out the things that are going to become useful. But this one particular episode that came into my mind was about the two paramedics go out to the scene and there's a, a mother and father there and they're very upset and they have a little, tiny little girl, cute little girl, but she's crying and her arm is wedged into a vending machine. And, of course, the parents have been trying to get it out. They can't get it out. The paramedics very gently try to pull it out. It just hurts her. They can't get her arm out of the vending machine. 
Now the fire trucks are showing up, and they're pulling electric saws and settling torches off the trucks. They're talking about cutting it away from the girl's arm, which is freaking the parents out, freaking her out. It's just, it's, it's not helping. It's making things scarier for them. And the one paramedic's watching all this, and he walks slowly over to the little girl, and he kneels down next to her, and he says, Sweetheart, do you have something in your hand? She goes, uh-huh. What do you got in your hand? She says, a candy bar. Would you let go of that? No! It's my candy bar. It's my gossip. It's my anger. It's my lust. It's my porno. It's my gambling. It's my candy bar. Well, he, he, he doesn't have enough Al-Anon to keep him there, so he backs away. <laughs> away and he just stands there for a minute pensively looking at her and he comes walking he must have been inspired he comes walking back over to her very slowly and as he's walking towards her she's glaring at him like oh you're the guy that wants to take away my candy bar my bottle my rage my gossip my judgment my candy bar and the guy walks over to her and he kneels down next to her and she's glaring at him. And he says, sweetheart, look, I'm just here to make you a promise. And she says, what? And he says, I want to promise you two brand new candy bars if you let go of that crumpled one in your hand. And she looks at him and she says, really? And he says, I promise. And because she trusts him, She lets go of the candy bar and her arm slides out of the vending machine. So the question that occurred to me is, for God's sakes, what's my candy bar? Because I don't hold on to stuff for no reason at all. I hold on to stuff because there's some secret illusion of value. Now, it it might be such an illusion, I can't even say it to you because it would sound silly. But it's there. And this process of uncovering, discovering, and discarding is, is, a, is a big deal. I, I love watching. I don't, my wife says that I've grown some. It's hard. It never looks that way on the inside. You know what I mean? It's just, it, it, I don't know why that is. I, I, you, can, you can see growth in me that I can't see. And I see growth in others that they can't see. It talks about that in the, in the end of the big book, to one of the appendixes, how we'll see the changes in a new person before they can see them in themselves. And that's really true. But my God, I've watched, my wife and I have been together almost three years. And I've watched, I watched what happened in her, I, the power of Alcoholics Anonymous and its ability to transform people is staggering. She has a, an amazing sponsor. She's a great man. She takes all the actions. She's a better, I'll tell you, she's a better A member than I am at times. I go to my home group Monday night, and I go there with the intention of, of tracking for new guys. Because that's what we're there for, really. We're not there for ourselves. We're there to, to look for new people to help. And I, I'm not in that meeting 10 minutes. I start talking to people I sponsor and my friends, and, you know, I get so distracted. My wife is like an, a bow and arrow with radar. She just, she's, she shoots those new people so quick. And it's, I used to think, you know, she's just doing this to make me look bad. That's all. <laughs> she's a great member of AA. And I watch that develop. And I, I got guys I sponsor that, that, that let me in enough. Because you got, you, you're never going to see that if all you see is the facade. Right? You got to, I'm pretty good at sponsoring people if you let me. You let me in. I have a, I have a guy who's sober 30 some years up in the Northwest. And when he was about 20 years sober, and he's a good member of AA, he's really willing, he's just, he's very active. He had a hard time doing the nightly review that's part of step 11. He had a hard time doing it. So 
I, I just said to him, I said, listen, you're, I, you need some structure. Maybe that'll help. Why don't you answer those questions in an email and send it to me every night? And he's a willing guy. He said, okay. And he started sending them. And, you know, if you've, if you've done that, you, you know, the questions, you know, where's I selfish, dishonest, resentful, fear, was I kind and loving towards all, as I have any, I kept anything to myself? You know, all those questions. And every single day, resent, no, self, no, fear, no, no, kind and loving, absolutely. Just, no, secret, no. Just, and it's, now, this is possible on occasion. But I know alcoholics. I know like me. Nobody. That's. It, think about it genuinely. Could you imagine a day where you weren't selfish at all? Or you weren't anxious or afraid at all? So, he's, so I finally, after a couple weeks of this, and I knew this is not right. I called him up and I said, listen, you're sending me these inventories every night. And, and, and you, you're not, no resentment, no fear, no selfish, no, kind of loving all the time. And I, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, oh, I'm very grateful for my sobriety. <sighs> so what I said to him next was more of God than me. It was brilliant, though. As I look back, I thought it was perfect. I don't know where it came from. It didn't come from me. I said to him, listen, I want you to do something. He said, yeah, what do you want? Anything. I said, I want you to print up those questions. I want you to make a hundred copies. I want you to give them to your wife to answer. And there's this silence on the phone in this little voice that goes, that's not fair. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Because when my, my sponsor of over 28 years, Clancy used to say that this was a disease of perception. One of the greatest things I can ever know and re-know and re as if I believe it and act accordingly is to know I don't know. Not easy when you when you got an ego that talks to me like mine talks to. And you know how, what's so clever about it? It talks to me in my own voice, right? My friend Don calls it the voice of the negotiator. It's the only thing. It's the only. There's no no one on the planet could get me to negotiate my own moral compass like my head can. If it scares me enough, if it worries me, and so uh, the problem is, I got to get God's grace to access this. And in order to get God's grace, I have to open myself up to Him. I have to trust Him, and trust is it's a long time coming for me. When I was a little kid, no, I wasn't a little kid. I was about sixteen. My third time in juvenile court. I was in a lot of trouble. I'm only 16. I'm in a lot of trouble. I got sent away. And I got sent away to a disciplinary school upstate New York on one of the Finger Lakes. And I'm up there. And and it's they, my parents, if they would have known what a wild school this was, they'd have never sent me there. It was all the deviant kids from the eastern United States were all grouped right there. I mean, it was amazing. That's where I discovered supplements for drinking and all kinds of stuff. And one day, it was on a lake, and right next to where the school is, there's a resort. And this resort had sailboats and motorboats, and it was like a, you know, a lake resort place. And and me and my buddy, we were we were drinking wine, cheap wine, which I like cheap wine. I don't like wine that's ever seen a grape. I like cheap wine. And we're drinking cheap wine and smoking reefer. And I don't know about you guys, but you get me stoned and half drunk. I know some stuff. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm looking at those sailboats, and I just know I'm a sailor. Now, I've never been in a sailboat, but I, you know, you just know stuff, right? So me and my buddy, we steal one of these little sailfish, these little two-man sailboats, and we paddle it out to the middle of the lake. Well, this is a lake that's, it's a finger lake, so it's really long and kind of narrow. And there's streams of wind that go down those, the middle of those lakes. They, they do ice boat races, on, and those ice boats get up to close to 100 miles an hour. That's how strong the current of wind is down the middle of those lakes. So we get out in the middle of that lake, we put that sail up. We don't know what we're doing, but somehow caught that wind. 
oh my God, we're zipping down that lake like, oh, yoo this is amazing. This is like really a good deal. And then we started noticing that the bottom of the lake was coming at us. And it's a rocky shoreline. And to our dismay, we discovered there's no brake pedal in this <laughs> sailboat. And we don't know what to do. And we're getting scared. And my buddy had seen this on, in a movie or a TV somewhere. He said, "Oh, well, we have to come about. Well, I don't know what that is. He doesn't know what that is either. <laughs> so we start trying to change the position of the sail. And that wind that has the power to take you anywhere also has the power to destroy you. And it turned us over in that lake. It's probably late October. Hypothermia is coming at us. We're hanging on to that hull. We don't know what to do. And one of the teachers has been up on the shore with a pair of binoculars looking at his two idiot students. (laughs) And he gets the motorboat and he comes out and he saves us. What's the point? Well, God's grace is like that wind. It's there for me. The problem is I don't know how to catch it. I'm, my sail's too full of Bob. I don't know how to set the sail. I don't know how to empty the sail so it will furl properly. I don't know how to come about. I don't know how to change course. I'm too rigid. I'm too egocentric. I don't know how to sail. And I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and you gave me sailing lessons. You told me how to, you, you slowly gave me actions to take, like going to the detox a couple times a week. What's that going to do for me? Those people can't even stay sober. How are they going to help me? And it was another way to reduce Bob temporarily to catch some wind. And um, I'll, say, I'll tell you this one little story, and then I'll probably end, maybe. <laughs> well, hey, if everyone else can say they're about to end and don't, I can too. <laughs> there was a guy in uh, in Las Vegas who was a, a pilot. He said a couple things that you know. You know, I hear things in AA and they don't do anything for me. And then a couple years later, I remember them and they do something for me. And he said that he thought AA could stand for altered attitudes. And I didn't like that. Because people all my life have been telling me I have a bad attitude. I don't even know what that is, but it's not good. (laughs) And he said an attitude is what pilots, we pilots talk about uh, in flying and setting courses. It's the angle of approach. And that later started thinking about that. I got a selfish self-centered, fear-driven angle of approach to life. No wonder I'm, I'm in problems all the time. And then he told a story one time. He said uh, he was in this little plane, and I'm not a pilot, so I might get some of the facts of this wrong, I suppose. He said he, he'd taken this plane up above its normal ceiling, which I guess is how high you're supposed to go in this particular type of plane, and he hit a wind shear. And he said it's the most frightening thing that he could ever experience. You, you're, you're thrown into a tailspin, and you're out of control, and you feel and are convinced you're going to crash and die. And he said every instinct in you is to pull back and to try to pull that nose up. And he said he'd been taught that at that moment, if he did that, he would surely crash and die. That what he had to do was push it forward which is contrary to every instinct in him, and then let it snap back on itself. And he said, this plane was created in such a manner that when you do that, it writes itself. Maybe my life's like that. If you went back in the 44 years that I've been sober and you looked at every time I was in trouble, you're going to look at you're going to find my fingerprints over that stick you're going to find my dna on that disaster truly that what i have to do is runs contrary to my basic instincts and that's to let go and trust god and what you dis- what i've discovered is one of the great things you i'm wrong about 
I don't have to protect me. I don't have to defend me. I don't have to do for me. My father does it all. I just have to let him. And that's the, that's the crux of the matter. When you're scared to let God, to trust God, to let go of that stick, that wheel, just to take your hands off of it and let it happen. And here's what I've discovered without exception. When I let go and I, I stop trying to direct things, God takes amazing care of every situation I've ever been in. He gives me everything I need to do everything I need to do. And I have sponsees that look at what I do. I, I, I'm very, very busy. And they, they say, I, oh, I could never do all that. Yeah, me neither. But when it comes time to do the next thing, somehow, somewhere, I've been given what I need to do the next thing, to go to the airport, to go down to the detox, to listen to that fifth step. You know the one where it's, you know it's going to be an hour about her. You know that one, right? <laughs> And it's never like I think it's going to be. It's always pretty good. Some of the some of the experiences I've had in sobriety, I've been resistant to doing certain actions, but I've done them because I said I was going to do them, and it turns out to be amazing. I've, I've been. I had a sponsee one time. He wanted he needed to talk to me, and he wanted me to meet him at a meeting that I don't particularly like. Because I've noticed some of the deficiencies of the people in there. I, you know, it's just, it's, it's my gift. <laughs> and I don't want to go to that meeting, but he wants, to, he wants me to meet him at that meeting. Oh, gee, Jesus, I don't want to go to that meeting. All right, I'll go to the meeting. You know, imagining that they're, for my self-sacrifice, they're going to build a statue of me at GSO. You know, I'm... Listen, we're, we're funny people. I want major accolades and credit for something I should just be doing anyway you know it's uh, I go to this meeting and I'm telling you I came out of that meeting and I thought my god that was the best meeting I'd been to in a long time and I guess uh, I guess God has to remind me continually that I don't know that I'm wrong a lot That my perception can't be trusted. And then probably more than anything, that he loves me. And he will take care of me. And my battle is how to let him. And how to get out of the way. So that's my striving in my sobriety the last many, many years is to trust God. It's in the face of every anxiety and fear you can imagine. To trust God. And I'll tell you, I don't, I don't think any of us ever... I mean, you can go to Bible studies, you can go to church, you can do all that stuff. But I don't think at a gut level you're ever going to understand how trustworthy God is until you trust him for a while. Because all that means anything to us is our experience. Wouldn't it be nice if an intellectual reckoning of God would be enough? But it doesn't seem to be for me. I've met people that it seems to be enough for them. They just decide one day they're going to believe and they just do and they're wonderful. And, you know, you kind of hate people like that. I mean, well, <laughs> try not to, but <laughs> it's too easy. Uh, I struggle towards the light. And I will probably always struggle towards the light. But the light's that much more beautiful when you struggle towards it. As anything that's worthwhile in life, my, my marriage is, is, is so dear to me because we, I don't know, I can't speak for her, but I'll tell you, I really work to make it good because it's important to me. And I'm committed. And everything we do here of any value is, is involved with action. You know, there's a... A lot of sentiments in the world about, some of them are so ridiculous, like AA is a selfish program. Stop it. (laughs) Or AA is a faith-based program. No, it's not. Faith isn't enough. I've sponsored clergy that drank themselves to death with more faith than most of us will ever have. 
The problem is not that we, not God, it's not that we don't believe in God, it's we can't access God. We can't access, we can't catch the wind. I need to catch the wind. I need God to be real in my life. Because there are moments, there have been moments in my sobriety where I've been scared to death, where I've been angry to the point where I, I'm homicide. I, 11 years sober, I, I hired a hitman. Not proud of that. <laughs> True story. Uh, there's mo- and God showed up and he took it away. For, he, he did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And you look back over the years, he's always done that. He's always been there. The, 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 the great thing and the sad thing is that this grace that he provides his kids is the most amazing thing in the world. And yet, it's often wasted on a guy who can't appreciate it. Thanks for listening.